we will contrast Northrop Josiah Gorgas in just a few minutes. Gorgas illustrates how a person of great managerial skill, with no real pipeline to Davis, could work miracles of supply. Even though the South never resolved the basic issue of states' control of the very means by which the war was waged, Gorgas was able to build a manufacturing base to supply armies in the field. Because of his success, we will discuss the Ordnance Bureau in much more detail. Due to Davis's military background, he was fond of giving orders. He had a tendency to overcommand instead of delegating. Thus, many of the men surrounding the president were yes-men. It is no surprise that the first Secretary of War, Leroy Pope Walker, failed for his only real qualifications was his support of Davis. Others, like the next man in this office, Judah P. Benjamin, succeeded because he had the tact to stroke Davis and the brilliance to execute his duties with skill. The position of Secretary of War kept changing. It would be an interesting exercise to compare and contrast Lincoln's problems with his generals with Davis's issues with the position of Secretary of War. Benjamin moved on to other positions, and George Randolph took over. Randolph was a fairly competent guy, but was a rubber stamp. There was an interim secretary for about a week before James A. Seddon took over. We will say more about him below. The last man in this critical job was the General John C. Breckinridge. By February of 1865, it was far too late for him to make a difference. But hope always a significant part of Confederate life, never died until the end of hostilities, if even then. In discussing leadership, a word must be said about the Confederate Congress. Since the states had the real power, Congress tended to be somewhat irrelevant. Here were a group of guys sitting in isolation in Richmond, trying to be effective. In some cases, they really could help, in providing finances for continuing the war effort, they had some success, but in most issues they contributed little or made things worse. Leaders in both houses distrusted the military. Congress had no confidence in the Secretary of War, who ever held this position. And his fear of the Secretary of Treasury for most of the war, Christopher C. Menminger, was serious. Worst of all, the President dictated to Congress what it should do. To add insult to injury, most of the time, Davis was right. The second branch of supply was ordnance. It was the bright shining star of Confederate management, thanks to the extraordinary head, Josiah Gorgas. Much of the rest of this evening's discussion will center on the Ordnance Bureau, but like the other two supply branches, I want to introduce it here. Except for the end of the war, the southern fighting man was fairly well equipped with arms and ammunition. This was the result of ordinance. Not only did this branch procure the material, it saw to it that it was stored, maintained, and delivered to the troops in a timely manner. Given the lack of production and distribution in the South at the start of the war, this was no small task. Of the 128,300 industrial establishments in the United States, 110,000 were loyal to the Union. Although time does not permit me to discuss his background tonight, the story of how this man from Pennsylvania came to be the salvation of the Confederacy is most interesting. He was, both before the war and during it, like an eagle forced to trot with the turkeys. But, unlike Jefferson Davis, he got along famously with his subordinates, and he had just enough people skills to get his way with superiors. The key to his success was his talent for organization and the ability to change plans when a new problem arose. He was firm when the South needed leadership and flexible when his country needed to change to adjust to the new realities on the ground. Although the ordinance was narrowly defined, to arms and ammunition. As problems developed, Gorgas jumped in and took charge, regardless of his having the authority to do so. So, at certain different times, he entered 
foreign affairs and created contracts that had all the earmarks of treaties with countries. He needed ocean transport, so he organized a fleet that looked like his private navy. He ran port operations, as would an interior minister. He needed plants to make arms and all types of equipment to stock these factories. Remember, 19th century machinery was powered by leather belts, so Gorgas got involved with agriculture. Now, unlike others in senior positions, Gorgas to do all of this because he had a tremendous capacity to select quality subordinates and delegate to them. Certainly no one in the Confederacy did more to prolong the war, except perhaps Robert E. Lee, then did Josiah Gorgas. We will return to more of his exploits shortly. The last branch we shall introduce is Quartermaster. There were two men who held this post, Abraham C. Myers from the start until August of 1863, and then Alexander R. Lawton. Myers was a very interesting fellow. He was the grandson of Charleston's first rabbi. Formal education was not his long suit. It took young Myers five years to graduate West Point due to poor grades. He was able to set up a reasonably good formal system of supply. However, three things doomed him to failure. Faced with the same situations uh, as Gorgas, Myers could not solve these issues. First, he was always at loggerheads with the states, particularly Brown of Georgia and Vance of North Carolina. Second, he was inflexible, such that when things changed on the ground, he found it hard to abandon his plans. He stuck with centralization of supply long after it was not working for him. Finally, and probably most importantly, he fought with everyone. He battled his bosses and the men who worked for him. His lack of tact cost him his job. It was wildly rumored that his wife, Marion, called Verena Davis a squaw. Whether this happened or not, by the summer of 1863, the top brass had had enough of Myers. He was not replaced, but General Lawton now outranked Colonel Myers, such that the quartermaster was now Lawton. Actually, forces in the ineffectual Congress continued to fight the promotion until 1864, but he was in control from August 10th until the end of the war. There is no doubt that Lawton was a better administrator than was Myers, but he was no miracle worker. After a census of resources, he had pressed for a uniform standard of procurement and production. Let me illustrate the grief that the quartermaster had to contend with, with using a story of the Navy's Osnabergs. Osnabergs is a rude linen fabric often used for lower class clothing. Lawton's census had shown that the Navy had a total control of a factory in South Carolina, making same. The plant had a capacity for producing 50,000 yards per month, but the Navy only needed 5,000 yards per quarter. The remainder was left to the plant to sell on the open market at a considerable profit. At the time when the South needed fabrics of all types, to have so much capacity leak out was a crime, particularly when we had a plant whose output was owned by the Navy. What Lawton did was try to place the plant under the quartermaster's control, take all of the output and deliver to the Navy what that service needed each month. Slowly, this plan came to be implemented, but far too slowly to solve the problem of supply for the quartermaster. Once again, we see the basic concept of a loose confederation of states working at cross-purposes with the war effort.